And welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries Second Chances, the program in which if you've been seeking that happiness, if you've been seeking to get rid of that guilt, if you've been seeking to set free, if you are seeking to change your life, stop seeking and start listening to what God has for you. And this program is presented for you to let you know that God loves you, God forgives you, and God loves you so much that he sent his most precious possession on the cross to die for our sins, to take our sin, and get rid of him at the cross. And that is Jesus came to set us free. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and so that our, that our, our God is a God of second chances, if you don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior before this half hour is done, we're going to give you an opportunity to be set free and to ask Jesus Christ into your heart. We want to welcome to our program today on Second Chances, Lydia Corpeting. She is the author of the book entitled Beyond the Colorful Coat, Living Out Your God-Given Dreams, and her first book entitled Bigger Than Impossible, Keys to Experiencing the Impossible Through God. And Lydia, thank you for joining us here on Second Chances. Well, I <laughs> pleasure to be here with you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us. And Lydia, uh, for the sake of all of us, um, you have a, an interesting background. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from, where you were born, and and about your family growing up? Okay, yes. Well, I was born into a strict old order Amish home in Iowa, and uh, I was the second to the oldest of seven children. Um, when I was three years old, my parents moved to Missouri where I was raised. And then when I was in second grade, about halfway through the second grade, my, my dad got a chainsaw. And um, the preachers in the church decided that that was against the church rules. And, uh, of course, I was a little girl and really didn't don't know everything that went on, but within uh, that, that school year, my parents were excommunicated from the Amish church. I was not allowed to go back to the Amish country school to finish up my school year. That was devastating. I was not allowed to walk the mile across the field to visit with my cousins anymore. And then I was put into... Uh, the one room schoolhouse, public school, where everybody except my two brothers and I, everybody else spoke English, and we were not allowed to speak English at home at all. Uh, corporal punishment was administered if we slipped, even happened to slip an English word in. We spoke Pennsylvania Dutch at home, and then um, with the Amish, they used the High German Bible. And... Uh, so it was just difficult. I just pretty much um, pulled back and, and crawled into a hole. Um, I couldn't speak at home, and I couldn't speak in, at school. And uh, so it was a pretty dysfunctional childhood that I had with a lot of responsibility placed on me, a lot of depression, uh, dyslexic, uh, besides, you know, the language barriers and things. And so... With just having said that, I I always like to share two of my life scriptures. The one is found in um, Psalms 40. Uh, the first part of that it says, "He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of that miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings." And He's put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and shall fear, and shall trust in the Lord. And uh, uh, my other scripture that I just uh, find so much consolation in because of you know where I was at it in the beginning, and that's in First Corinthians one, starting verse with verse twenty six. It says, "For you see your calling, brother, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty." Not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, and base things, 
of the world and things which are despised has God chosen, yes, and things that are not to bring it uh, to not to bring to not things that are, and that's so that no flesh can glory in His presence. So just you know, with that little bit of background, uh, from there it it really progresses to where the Lord picked me up and just miraculously gave me visitations and and help me. Now, Lydia, for, for the sake of many listeners that may not understand uh, what an Amish person is and the culture, uh, I have just a little bit of insight because where we're located here in New Jersey is about uh, two and a half miles from Pennsylvania Dutch country. I've been there many times. It's, it's very beautiful country, and it's very mm-hmm. common that we will see uh, when we go there to uh, see some of the Christian presentations or um, go shop at some of the shops or eat in some of the family restaurants. Very common to see the Amish with their horse and buggy, but really, uh, that's all I really know about them. I know they're very gifted and talented with wood and and different things like that. So could you give our listeners a little insight into the Amish culture, although I, I know it's probably different from, from place to place, but could you give us a little right. insight into, in, into it? Right. Well, yeah, that's right. From place to place, it's different. And, you know, even from era to era, I'm, I'm close to 70 years old now, and uh, I was a little girl back then. There are probably few of the areas that are as strict anymore as what they were back then, and yet some some of them may be stricter too because um, there's something about the Amish. They are afraid that they will lose their young people, um, but they are very gifted, as you say, in in woodworking, in crafts. My brother just went to a barn raising this past. Uh, Saturday, and just within hours, there were 170 of the Amish men working together, and had the barn up from the from the bottom all the way up to the roof. So they know how to work together. Uh, they have work skills: uh, the sewing, the quilting, uh, canning, gardening, uh, cooking, homemaking. Just so many things that are really lost in our culture today i am blessed i am totally blessed to have learned many of those things and how to survive on meager um, means where a lot of people would probably not do that so in the natural it's really um in in some ways a really rich culture but spiritually where I am from, and and again, I can't say that it's this way with everybody, but uh, many Amish, uh, Amish, there are thousands of Amish or young people leaving the Amish uh, because they're dissatisfied. For me, I did not know Jesus. I knew that there was a God, and I was scared to death of him. I just thought whenever there was a rain, a a lightning thunderstorm, that God was wanting to strike me with lightning. I was so afraid of God. And what a misconcept I had, how loving and how kind he is. But I didn't know that. I knew that uh, there was a devil, and I was very scared of the devil, too. I knew there was eternity, and eternity, my dad explained was like a circle that had no end. And I would try, I would project myself around that circle in my mind, trying to find the end, thinking that if I could find an end to the circle, maybe there would be uh, an escape, that I wouldn't have to go to hell, because I knew that they, they taught us there was an end of the world, and there was a heaven and hell, and Maybe if I kept the laws of the church and dressed plain enough, and and uh, and that, of course, would involve that I wouldn't be proud if I dressed with the black long dresses and the black high top shoes and and did everything to the T. Maybe maybe I could make heaven, and uh, so I was very very miserable. 
and that that also caused a lot of my sickness in my early childhood and uh, so on. And so the link of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and that by grace I am saved through faith, that not of myself, but his grace that saved me, that was a link that was missing in my life, and it's missing in a lot of people's lives. Um, a lot of our precious Amish young people are, are leaving because they want something better, but then they turn to the ways of the world and don't really understand that Jesus loves them. He loves all of us, and that he's made a way for us to escape eternal punishment because we know hell wasn't created for people. It was created for the devil and his angels. <laughs> so that's the, that's the part that seems to be missing in many of the Amish religions. Very plain, uh, horse and buggy, you know, the dress and all the outward things are stressed. But the issues of the heart just uh, seem to not be addressed in, in many of the circles. One last thing I want to share uh, about the culture just that, that uh, I have observed, and I, and I found it very interesting. I hear very often that uh, most of the Amish homes, and like I said, my knowledge is only what I can find in Pennsylvania Dutch country, uh, in Pennsylvania Amish country, but I understand that many of the, the families do not have electricity, and I find it very interesting. I have, uh, have had some business dealings with them, for wood items and, and swing sets and things of that nature. But I find it very interesting that they will all have cellular phones and they'll even actually text you a, a, a message. That I find very interesting. <laughs> well, that's, of course, something, like I say, now that they they do allow. And, you know, some people, some areas that have a business, like a shop or something, they're actually allowed to have a telephone in their their shop. Now, when I grew up, there wasn't any telephone unless you went to the neighbors. You could go to the neighbors and use their telephone, or you could go to the neighbors and ask to ride in their car, but you couldn't have one yourself. I understand. We are visiting with Lydia Corpening. She is the author of the book entitled Beyond the Colorful Coat, Living Out Your God-Given Dreams. Uh, Lydia, how did how did you come to find Jesus uh, in that culture? Uh, what was it that led you to the road to uh, learn about Jesus and then be accept him to be Lord of your life? You know, that was probably a pretty big process for me to really come to that. I uh, The Lord visited me through visions and dreams once he... Uh, gave me a, a nighttime vision. I saw a piece of material with the scripture reference, Matthew 311, embroidered on that. I memorized that verse, and uh, I did not know what it meant. It, um, those were the words of John the Baptist, and it said that, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I had no idea what the baptism of the Holy Ghost was, and I really didn't think that I liked the idea of being baptized with fire, though I had no idea what that was. <laughs> and then the other script, uh, um, vision I had was actually a daytime vision. I was milking a cow, watching the streaks of milk um, streak down into my bucket, and I saw as it was typed, as if it were, would have been typed on the streak of milk going into my book at capital R-O-M-8. And at that time, I didn't even know there was a Romans 8. But as we discovered, there is a, that's a fantastic uh, scripture about the victory of the life lived in the spirit rather than the life lived in the flesh. So those were... Um, visitations that God gave me during my adolescent years. When I was 15, my parents moved back to a different settlement in Iowa. I joined, I went through a catechism class, 
and I do think that some of the questions were things like, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And um, the salvation message may have been there. I could not grasp it because of, I am such a visual person, and they were still telling me that I had to do this or I couldn't do this and I couldn't have this. And, you know, at least we could drive a car, but it had to be black and, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, my simple mind <laughs> just didn't quite grasp. And, and as I just kept reading the Word and, and seeking God, um, Finally, I came to a place that uh, the Lord just gave me a, a direct uh, visitation and filled me with His Holy Spirit. At that time, of course, as I grew more, grew more in the Lord, uh, the church realized that I was reaching into areas that they didn't they didn't believe in. And so, as an eighteen year old, then I was excommunicated from that denomination. But that was my first step into real freedom, because then I could see, I just remember looking at other people that weren't dressed the way I was, and it was so liberating to just, oh, I can I can hug you, I can reach to you, I'm not confined just to my little box, my little denomination, because you will also believe in Jesus, and... Uh, so that was the beginning of, of a step into victory that I have, I, I struggled for many, many years with legalism, legalism and things. So Now, uh, another major step for you, I'm sure, in your life was not only accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but uh, finding a husband. Uh, tell us how you, you met your husband. Oh, Okay. Yeah, my friends were all getting married, and I still was thinking I was fat and ugly and not dating, and um, uh, I was almost 25, and I had started working in a factory where my brother was working, and one day, well, I should backtrack. It, before that, I had been at a, had was just getting ready to go to Bible College in New York, and my pastor had gotten me up to uh, give a goodbye message before I went to, off to New York. And uh, my future husband was in that congregation, and I didn't know that he was there. But he, he says, well, I'm thinking now I see, finally see a nice girl, and she goes off to Bible college. Well, I only did one semester at Elam Bible College in New York, and then I came back home, and I felt like the Lord was saying for me not to go back, and that's when I started working at the factory with my brother. Then my husband's, well, my father-in-law, but he started working with my brother, and the two of them got their heads together, and then um, we I actually had a blind date, we went to a fellowship meeting. Uh, at that fellowship meeting on our first date, my husband ran to the altar, gave his heart to the Lord, and uh, we had uh, we had a very whirlwind courtship. I'm I'm not proud of that, but you know we knew each other for a month, or we were getting acquainted in that first month. And then we got engaged, and a couple months later we were married, and which definitely is not the way to do it. But praise God, we've been together now for 44 years, and uh, we've gone through a lot of rough stuff that we wouldn't have had to have gone through if, if uh, you know, we would have taken a little more time to get a foundation under us at the beginning. But I guess I thought, well, I'm 25. And uh, life's going away from me. I better get married while I have a chance. Amen. Um, your family, it says here, was a missionary family to the Philippines. Tell us, tell us how your family became a missionary family, and uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was uh, pretty amazing. We, Russell and I, always felt like God's call was on us to. Uh, 
minister and maybe do missionary work and so on. And uh, so through a series of events, a lot of moves and back and forth, uh, we wound up going to uh, San Antonio, Texas, where my husband attended International Bible College there in San Antonio and graduated from there. And our pastor, the late John Bell, spoke into our lives and said that you folks need to be praying about going to the Philippines. I didn't even know where the Philippines were. And after he said that, we got down the globe and found the Philippines located on the other side of the world from us. And I just told Russell, well, I've never been up in an airplane. That we can't do that. And uh, I figured that settled it. But the Lord uh, led, led us to here and meet some um, missionaries from the Philippines. And uh, the Lord began to especially deal with my husband's heart. And we began to... Uh, do some itinerary work, some praying, and some preparing. And uh, then in uh, 1982, we went to the Philippines and then uh, worked in a lot of the remote areas, walked the rice paddies, slept on the bamboo floors, uh, and just uh, we built a church in one of, on one of the small islands there. We did seminars for um, ministers and pastors and things. So, yeah, it was quite an endeavor. Our youngest daughter was four years old, and our oldest one was uh, 11. We had three daughters that we took with us when we went over. Amen. Um, we are visiting with Lydia Corpening. She is the author of Beyond the Colorful Coat, Living Out Your God-Given Dreams, and a previous book entitled Bigger Than Impossible Keys to Experiencing the Impossible Through God. Uh, Lydia, before we continue on for the last couple of minutes of the interview, if someone would like to learn more about your books, learn more about you, uh, is there a website or a place they can uh, get that information? Uh, my books are out there on Amazon, um, Amazon, and any of the books there. Um, I can, I can give. My book publisher is Life Sentence Publishing. I do not, at this time, I'm working to get a website. I do not have a website, but I would be fine with even passing out my um, email address. Okay, if, that, um, would, people that would be fine. Me that. Yeah, that would be fine. Go ahead and give us that if you'd like. Okay, my email address is rlv dash. S O G at charter dot net. So that's R as in Russell, L as in Lydia, V as in Victory, dash S as in Sam, O as in Oscar, G as in George at charter dot net. Okay. So they could they could um, get in contact with me there, or um, they can look up my books too, like I say on Amazon. And I believe if you go to Amazon and just type in those words or the names of your books, uh, they will both come up. Am I correct? I believe so. Uh, especially Amazon Kindle is where they want to look for bigger than impossible. And lifesentencepublishing.com is where they can find uh, Beyond the Colorful Coat, Living Out Your God-Given Dreams. Correct? Right. Right. Okay. That's correct. And actually, I should say that Bigger Than Impossible right now on Amazon Kindle is a free download. Wow. Praise the Lord. Okay. Yep. yep. So I'm getting thousands of downloads on that book. So uh, your audience might as well jump in and, and be a part of it. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, Lydia, we only have a couple more minutes. Uh, quickly, if you could, uh, how did you... Uh, come to write your your first book and then your second book uh, in the next uh, if you can give it to us in the next uh, minute or two that answer well the first book just came to me uh, when I was re doing my Bible reading and came to the story of Joseph and began to see a pattern there how the clothes that the Bible talks about that Joseph wore became symbolic of leading him down a pathway uh, through slavery, through prison, and finally to where he received that royal robe of spiritual, which, which is symbolic of our spiritual authority. 
I had no idea I was writing a book, and uh, but as I started writing the inspiration God gave me, God said a book, and so that was the first one. The other one was just that the Lord told me that he wanted me to write the next book, and I was asking him, what is it? He said, just write what I tell you, and that's a, a tremendous faith-building message, and um, really goes back into, each chapter goes back into my childhood and projects forward into a faith-building message. Understood. Lydia, of course, as we mentioned at the very beginning part of the program, the number one reason this program is put on the air is to give people the opportunity, just like you many years ago, to invite Jesus Christ into their life to be Lord of their life. And would you be willing to lead our listeners that are willing and ready and able to ask Jesus into their heart in a word of prayer to, to do just that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. You just pray with us, and let this be the prayer of your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth to die on the cross to redeem me, to buy me back from my sinful nature. I repent of all of my sins. I repent of the rejection that I have had against you. And I receive you now, not only as my Savior, but I ask you to be the Lord of my life and guide me. Thank you for doing this. I receive your salvation, and I rejoice in the work that you have done in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our guest on Second Chances has been Lydia Corpening, the author of her first book, Bigger Than Impossible, The Keys to Experiencing the Impossible Through God, and her newest book entitled Beyond the Colorful Coat, Living Out Your God-Given Dreams. Uh, Lydia, any uh, any more works uh, coming up, or another book you're working on, anything like that? Yes, I'm in the very beginning stages of uh, a book that will be God's Church Arising from Behind the Scenes. Okay. And, uh, uh, any idea when we might see that out? I am not sure. It just depends on how much um, time I can give to it. But I'm taking notes and, and working at it, and uh, I expect the Lord to open up the fountain, and, and it'll be coming out. Well, I just, well, I just, I just want to thank you for taking time to be with us. It has been a blessing, and uh, we want to continue to... Um, I pray blessings on you, your work, and all the things that uh, you do. So thank you so much for being with us. Well, you're welcome, and thank you so much, too. It has been a privilege. Our guest has been Lydia Corpeting, the author of Beyond the Colorful Coat, Living Out Your God-Given Dreams. And remember, if you go to Amazon.com, there's a free download right now of Bigger Than Impossible, Keys to Experiencing the Impossible Through God, which was her first book. And uh, if you'd like to Send Lydia a little correspondence. You can email her at rlv.sog at charter.net. Tune in next week for more Second Chances right here from Advantage Radio Ministries.